Welcome to Stories, Wisdom, and Recipes, and Happy New Year. My name is Lawrence Pugliese. On today's program, we have Mr. Bob Mitchell, and all the way from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. What's the name of the band? Boris Garcia's Family Reunion. <laughs> Before we get to those great guests, in honor of Valentine's Day, I'm going to read for you a sonnet by William Shakespeare, the, the uh, 130th sonnet, and it goes like this. My mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mi mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet, by heaven, I think my love as rare as any she belied with false compare. Ladies and gentlemen, Boris Garcia's <coughs> family reunion. Shots of whiskey is part of his plan But we don't need to understand It's all well in hand But in whose hands I wonder Keep your doors locked The chambers pull, the hammers cock Be afraid of the dark Keep out of the reach of children Cause it's all about fear Whether bombs or wars are four more years It's all that we hear And we hear only what they'll let us hear We hear only what they'll let us hear Garcia's Republican Reunion. Yeah. Got that right? Is that right? Oh, yeah. Close enough. Close enough? Republican Rebellion. Republican Rebellion. Yeah. Let's leave the word Republican out of this show. <laughs> Thank you for coming up, guys. All the way from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They're here today with us on Stories, Wisdom, and Recipes. And they'll be back two more times. That was called All for the Best. And uh, I want to wish you again a happy Valentine's Day, happy New Year's. We haven't seen you since December. Uh, we have Bob Mitchell on the program today. And before we get to Bob, I also want to ask you please to stop sending flowers and, and get well soon cards to Senor Stavala. He's fine. You know, I got some nasty hate mail for, from the people for the ethical treatment of cold bearers. I didn't even know that group existed, but 
they seem to think that I objectified him and his cold. I am sorry, you know, but uh, that was his own, his own choice. But he's all right. Don't worry, folks. We'll be back in two weeks. We'll have Rich, Je Rich Jenkins then as well. So, today's program, Mr. Bob Mitchell. M most of you probably have seen Mr. Mitchell around town. He's, he's very active in our community, though he doesn't call himself a community activist. Uh, he calls himself basically, it seems to me in our short conversation, just a, a human being doing what he thinks all human beings should do, participate, take on the responsibility as part of uh, a town, a nation. So let's see what his views are today here on Stories, Wisdom, and Recipes. Mr. Bob Mitchell. Thank you, sir, for being here. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, too. What would you think of the band? Very well. Yeah? yeah very well. Um, I like a little bit, bit more bluesy and uh, soft, but uh, for two-step, you know, that kind of thing. I was never one of those who could dance fast. I'm not good at dancing fast either, <laughs> no. Um, I wanted to uh, get right into the early days of your life. Uh, where were you born? Binghamton, raised. New York. Binghamton? Raised here. Uh, my family lived in Binghamton for two years. And uh, my uh, father moved my mother and myself to Scranton, where he worked in the mines. Dad was a coal miner? Yes. Very proud of the fact that uh, he worked with his hands. And uh, he was uh, he had big double hands. And they were always cracked and bleeding. And if, uh, you said something that my father did not like. If he hit you with one of those massive hands of his, you were hurt. And you remember? You, yes, and you didn't do it again. Uh, he uh, always admired my dad. I never really understood him because he was very strict. Uh, he believed in certain things, and he was a staunch Baptist. Now, when you were when you were raised, if you don't mind me uh, you know, interrupting for a second, just to give people an idea, what what uh, decade are we talking now? Well, <clears throat> I admit to being now seventy six. Seventy six. And uh, a little uh, embarrassed because I don't feel seventy six on a good day. On a bad day, well, it's something different. I uh, have always been very happy and proud of being whom and what I am. And I've always been a history buff. And I've engaged in debates wherever and whenever, regardless of whether it was civil rights, history, politics, what have you. I have some fairly strong views. I believe that a man should be a man, and he should do all of those things which are beneficial to him as a man. Not necessarily as a white man or black man or red man or whatever, just as a man and as a citizen of this country. Now, do you, do you think you, you, uh, some of these principles you live by were uh, rooted in you from your earlier days, raised by your strict father, raised in a coal mining town in Scranton? Yes. Yes to all of the above. My dad, uh, he only had to tell me once to do something, and I did it because... Three of his best from that miner's belt, I can assure you, you remembered for quite a while. And uh, I tried not ever to make my father become perturbed with me, because it was very costly. Well, what was it like uh, living, living in Scranton uh, back in the Those 30s, days? 40s, 50s? Um, Scranton was the, was the kind of town that you were strong in neighborhoods. And I lived in Green Ridge, and I knew everybody in the 13, 14, 1500 blocks of uh, Penn Avenue. You still live there, don't you? I have a property there. I no longer live there, but uh, I have property there, uh, half a block away from St. Paul's. And uh, everyone got along. And everybody worked, mothers, fathers. I sold papers down by the uh, Scranton Times on the corner of Penn Avenue and uh, Spruce Street. And as I got a little tougher, well, I moved another next block up. By the time that I was, uh, I think I started when I was about eight or nine. By the time I was 16, 
Uh, I had a few problems in school. And by the time I was 17, I repeated one or two problems. My father said, come with me. And uh, as everybody knew in Greenwich, you never argued with Bob Mitchell Sr. And I went to Wilkes-Barre. And he didn't see me again for three and a half years. And I tried to tell him, Pa, I'm too young. He said, be quiet. He sent you to Wilkes-Barre? No, he took me to Wilkes-Barre. Took you to Wilkes-Barre? And I joined the Army. Oh, I see. I see. That's the way he dealt with these repeating uh, incidences of whatever. Well, my father never had to tell me more than once not to do something because it was very costly for but my posterior. So, <laughs> for your posterior, that's a good one. So, uh, when you went to the service, did you face, what did you face there? Where did you go? Uh, I went uh, from Wilkes-Barre to Philadelphia where I was sworn in. And then we went to, um, not New Cumberland. Uh, I can't call it to mind, it's an army base where the inductees first go. Mm -hmm. And then I went from there to Aberdeen, Maryland. And at that time, it was a uh, segregated army. And uh, I was there for about mm, 12 weeks. I came home for a brief furlough, and uh, I then went overseas. And there were... We had a few problems what kind? in the Army. What kind? Based on ra race? Yes. Ra racial tension? E well, you could say that. We, we had a few problems, and uh, we uh, gave as well as we got. Um, you knew that if you went to town, like we were in the, in the Philippines, for example, we knew that if you went to town and there was a southern division, road from us and uh, they thought that they were pretty tough and we proved to them that they weren't as tough as they thought. We um, were a long time bitter about that even to this day. When you say we you mean you and the, the other uh, guys in your in my outfit. In your outfit. It was segregated. In those yeah. Days. I, um, we were overseas and we had a few problems. And contrary to what you read in the newspaper, we took care of them. Um, I was a uh, bitter man for a long time against situations where regardless of what you did, how you did. You never did enough. It was never good enough, and so forth. Be because of uh, the color of, the, of your skin. That's right. And I would put it to you simply that we gave as good as we got. We had uh, some individuals from the north, and some men were from the south. And Southern GIs were pretty tough if they were, if they were 10 to your one, or 15 or 20 to your one. But man for man, we took care of them. Was there, a, was there a fairness when the upper brass dealt with this sort of conflict? Not all the time, no, not all the time. Uh, it's a long time ago, but uh, there were some bitter times. You've gotten through that. Yes, it's, it's, it's different now. But invariably, we always had to take the short end. And uh, when we could defend ourselves, we did very well. I'm here to tell you, we did very well. And for example, when we came back, uh, there was an officer at the bottom of the ship there, the gangplank, and it said, he said, white soldiers this side, black soldiers that side. Now this is 1948, 1949, and this is short. Now there, uh, let me preface my remarks by saying this, that there were 
We were attached to the 86th Division, the Black Hawk Division. Had the uh, Black uh, Eagle on its shoulder. And all in all, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. But... Um, when you say it was as bad as it could have been. It was not. It was not as bad. Okay. Yeah. We, uh, we knew that if we were out on pass or whatever, we had to be 10, 15 strong. And we because had Because fellow soldiers out of, from a different regiment might attack you, not an enemy group from That's another. That's correct. Fellow Americans, fellow yes. citizens. Yes. And I, I could see how that would create bitterness for anybody who had to deal with that. I can see. I mean, yes, I, I it think was. I, it would affect me the same. It took me an awfully long time to get over. I wouldn't say hate, but uh, I was a bitter man for a long time. Well, how? I mean, when you came back, then, mm -hmm. when you came back, and you mentioned how the officer said, "Blacks over here, whites over there." No, there was a man to to, to set set you aside of what outfit went where and so forth. W were things equal for both? Not all the time, no. And, and then when you came back, well, I, there's so many different ways I could go with this, mm -hmm. but when you came back to the United States, you came back to Scranton then, mm -hmm. your attitude about your worldview was decidedly different than, when you, than, than before you went into the service? More, yeah. more, more cynical? Yes. Because you found it a bit more egalitarian here in, in Scranton than, than you did in the service? Would that be safe to say? Or was Scranton sort of difficult as well as a, an African-American, a black man, back during your adolescent years? Back then, years? Um, it wasn't that bad, and it could have been a whole lot worse. Uh, I know that in the... Um, in high school. You went to Central? No, Tech. Tech? And, uh, I would have guessed Central. <laughs> Such a bright man. I would have guessed. <laughs> Tech's a great school, too. Yeah. But Central was the prep, wasn't it? Yeah, well, that was the so-called elitist school, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I learned at an early age. I always loved books. And I began to read about uh, uh, the Civil War and... Uh, some of the uh, black men who did great things in this country and who were not slaves. And I could never understand, I could remember standing up in the class and telling them, how is it that you can tell me that blacks were slaves? And in the first century, there was a fella from Africa who kicked everybody's backside for almost a thousand years. But curiously enough, it's not in the history books. And are you trying to tell me that because it's not in the history books and you know that it is true, but you curiously don't remember, don't put that in the book to make me feel insecure or what have you. And uh, when it came to uh, debates on history, I gave as good as I got, I can assure you. You did your own research, your own study. Yes, and I, uh, a couple of teachers put me out of class because I didn't necessarily conform to what they considered I should believe about history. Do you think that's still going on to a certain extent in this country? Certainly. Certainly. Uh, if it were not, well, let me put this nation in my perspective as I see it. Is that senator from Mississippi, was it, that uh, he didn't like blacks and so forth and so on? And it turns out that uh, he was involved with a young black girl and had a child by her. Yeah, um, he just died recently. Trent Lott. Carolina. Yeah, Sean yeah. Thurman. No, Trent uh, Lott, he has, his, he has another. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry for the mixture there. These guys know because they're, they're real big supporters. <laughs> Boris Garcia's Republican reunion. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> but, but you're talking about uh, the, general, the, the senator, Sean Thurman. Yeah. He was a hypocrite, basically. Well, they all oh. were. Okay. And, and here's the thing. They say that uh, they had to go to Africa to steal the land and to incorporate everything that they had. 
on the mistaken belief that they were somebody. Now, I would say this to you, that if you talk about slavery, then let us go back to the first century. And Hannibal, I believe, taught an awful lot of people just how strong and how tough he was as a black man and as a black general, and he ruled the world for a certain part of time. Let us jump to, say, the 15th to 16th century when uh, so-called Europeans went to Africa, and what did they do? They stole everything they came in contact with. Uh, Napoleon took all that wealth out of Africa and took it back to Europe. A person who was a pale skin, that was indentured, sold, slave. Well, for example, what's that fellow, that uh, Braveheart? Didn't he document who was a slave, when, and what period of time? Mm -hmm. And the enforcing of uh, his, a man's abuse of a woman, and so forth and so on. So this has been going on since the beginning of time, Absolutely. and it's continuing to go on today. Absolutely. The history is not told as fairly, as well balanced as it should be. Not so much fairly as the truth is what I'm speaking The about. truth isn't being told. That's right, not, and not in all cases. Not in all cases. And uh, today, 76 years old, mm -hmm. from the point you, you came back to Scranton, your, your, mm -hmm. your stint in the service, when you came back, did you have a certain type of plan for your community? What, what were you thinking when you came back? You, how old were you? Maybe 20? 20, yes. 20 years old? Yeah. A little bit more worldly. Mm -hmm. You've been in different parts of the country. You've been overseas. Mm -hmm. Now you're back in Scranton. What, what plans did you have at that point when you were 20? Um, and what opportunities did you think you had when you were 20? Well, first of all, when I first got back, I knew I was sick. I had TB, and I had malaria, and I had jungle rot in my feet. And uh, if, if you turn it into sick bay overseas, there was a, uh, if you had TB, or you had uh, jungle rot in your feet, they'd send you to a ward there in the fourth general called the fourth ward because it was pretty deadly and they didn't want you to infect people coming back here to the states and you didn't always come out of that ward okay a lot of guys didn't make it a little scary yes yes so that i really didn't say anything about the fact that i was having a problem and i didn't start spitting up blood until we were halfway home so you got back and you had a challenge of dealing with TB. Yeah. And malaria. Yeah. Uh, so and fungus in my feet, both feet. And uh, there used to be a uh, VA uh, office in 100 block of North Washington Avenue. And that's where I checked in at. And, uh, well, actually, I, 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 I was found to have TB in New Jersey. But... I had, uh, I've been in about seven or eight hosp VA hospitals, and they did a good job on me, so here I am. How long did that, that, that set you back, a year? Uh, no, I was in and out of the VA hospitals for almost eight years. Eight years. And, and when did you start embarking on, on your, uh, your sense of community, your sense of self, what you were going to do with your life, what Bob Mitchell was, what was next for Bob Mitchell? Well, I... Uh, I really didn't know. I wanted to go back to the school and finish. But every time it looks like I, I felt a little better, and either I checked out of the hospital or they said you could go home for a little while, I'd get sick again. And uh, in those days, they had, if you had TB, they took out your rib cage on one side, and you looked like half a man, and you lasted two, three years. And I kept going to different VA hospitals hoping that I could come to a VA hospital that would fix me up. And lo and behold, I think it was the sixth or seventh year after going to the different hospitals, uh, I was up near the Canadian border, uh, Sun Mountain, New York. And uh, 
this doctor there was from Oliphant. And he saw He's from Oliphant? Up yeah. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, and he said, uh, who's this guy, Bob Mitchell? I said, I am, doctor. Come with me. I got just the thing. And uh, he fixed me up. He took out three ribs in the front and three in the back, top half of my lung, and I came home. And uh, I guess I, I was drawing a disability, but I missed an exam, and they took it away. And uh, so I, I worked at a gas station pumping gas. And uh, What part of town? In uh, Penn Avenue. Used to be, um, what's it? The... Uh, the fire chief. Uh, I, I, I can't think the of the fire gas. chief. Uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking <laughs> and about. Uh, I worked different jobs, and then I got a chance as I got better. I got a chance to go up to uh, the tank plant, uh, Chrysler the defense plant, and I was in quality control there for a while. And, and that uh, was located in the vicinity, or was that that's right, right up there in Einan. Okay. And uh, when Kennedy was killed, or be good to him, I was in quality control, and I said, well, if they lower the flag, he's gone. And sure enough, and they laid us off little by little by 1964, we were out. And I uh, took different jobs from that point on, and the kids were coming and was raising the family and so forth, and I always had two or three jobs. But I always felt good about myself, and as I said, I was a history buff, and I was a guest speaker at a couple of classes at the university, and I gave them my version of history. Well, we're going to get in into that books. some more. <laughs> I want to, I, I'm trying to set a backdrop for people yeah. to understand who Bob Mitchell is. Well, so he's, they, he's, all, he's all of these things. I'm a, I'm a history buff because... Uh, well, your experience is incredible. So, <laughs> I mean, the things that you've the seen, the things that you've... Uh, you faced, I mean, getting some ribs taken out, part of your lung, that's a huge uh, dilemma, I would imagine. Uh, facing discrimination um, by fellow citizens when you're overseas, and getting through bitterness, which many people never get through. All of that stuff, to me, uh, seems, makes me realize that I, uh, I haven't faced the same sort of challenges, um, and I want to see where that's brought you to today. Right now, we're probably, and we're going we're gonna to take a break with some music. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're probably about, uh, what, in your 30s? Yes, late th 30s. Late yeah. 30s. Okay, let's hold it there. All right. And we'll take a break. And I'm sorry to keep busting these guys. They're not the Republican reunion. They... They don't like Republicans, to be quite honest with you. Well, that's, so, that's not true. I know lots of Republicans that are Christy very Whitman's nice. not bad. Yeah, you, you think she's cute. That's it. Uh, Boris Garcia's family reunion, and I guess they do like Republicans. We like everybody. Yeah. It's about love. It's all about it's all love. About love. It's all about uh, love, baby. We're going to hear another song from them now. This particular piece is entitled Bully, and I uh, hope you enjoy it. We'll be back in a few more moments with Bob Mitchell. Boris Garcia's family reunion. One, two, one, two, three, four. He intimidated me just to make me believe. But when I don't, he ball up his fist and roll up his sleeve. A bully take your money and he take your watch. Cause friendship to go down another night. Well, a bully see me with my new pair of kicks. If I don't take them off, you know I get my legs I share with the bully some of my chips And he snatches the whole bag away from my lips, yeah Wish I could tell him uh -huh. Don't be a bully to all brother don't be a bully uh -huh. don't be a bully don't be a bully don't be a 
here from Philadelphia to alienate most of my audience. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I really do. No. That's fine. That's fine. You guys really are fantastic. And I want to give you a moment to share. We'll some love mail, too. Yeah. Send me some love mail. You probably don't get a lot of that. No, I do. I just want to say for the record, watch what you say about Scranton Technical High School, buddy. I know. You went to Scranton Tech. Right, I know. Right, well, Scranton right. Tech is awesome. All right. All right. I'm just insulting everybody. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point? What's It'll the difference? Yank you off the air. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, do you have? Do you guys have a website that you want to share with the audience? Do you have any gigs yeah, coming up? Well, BorisGarcia.com. It is almost ready, so keep checking at it, and we won't spam you. We'll keep you updated so you can inform your audience when we are up and running. Okay. If All right. Care. That's it. No, they'll <laughs> care. A lot of music lovers uh, up here in Scranton that watch this show. And uh, again, thank you for for adding to the, to the dynamic of, of this program by coming all the way up. And we're going to have a couple of uh, libations you, later, yeah, right? Thank you, and thank, yeah. you know, and thank you, sir, yeah. for, uh, for your service because you know, you, you're, you fought the hard fight. It's easy for guys like us because <laughs> we laid the groundwork for freedom. And, right. and we're lucky because guys like you came before us. Otherwise, our world would be a lot more of a mess. So thank yeah. you. Well put. We had lots, we had lots of help. All complexions, I can well, assure yeah, you. I mean, at this time and this space in the world, there's no room for that. There's yeah. No room this is turning into a love fest. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Forrest Garcia's family reunion. Thank you again, guys. We'll be back one more time this uh, program to share an, uh, another original tune. My name is Lawrence Pugliese. This is Stories, Wisdom, and Recipes. And we have Bob Mitchell here at the table. I'd like to thank some folks who helped put this show together before I forget. Marjorie Michelle. She was the contact that brought Mr. Mitchell to the table. Thank you, Marjorie. And we also had uh, some help from Aaron McAllister. And as always, we have Sean Haggerty in the back. And uh, we have Mark and Scott. And I can't remember the other cameraman's guy name. What's, what's the other cameraman's name? What's your? Steve. Steve. Thank you to the crew. But now we get back to Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell, we left you getting laid off from the tank plant mm -hmm. in Einan in your late 30s. JFK had been shot. Mm -hmm. Uh, that whole time period, uh, what was it like for you when you witnessing what was going on with Martin Luther King, Dr. King, uh, with John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, with you know, the Bay of Pigs, mm -hmm. what have you? Well, I, I couldn't get over the fact that uh, he was assassinated. And as I said, I've always been a history buff. So I, I never thought that they would kill a president of the United States. And I never thought that there would be so much mass confusion about the fact of what they had done and who was involved and so forth. Uh, the things that I remember in particular was 
communist Cuba, how could a man like Lee Harvey Oswald could he get in and out of this country and go to Russia and go to Cuba and so forth and so on, like going to cross the street? Uh, I always felt that there were, for want of a better term, sinister forces involved with the killing of a president. Well, do, you, do you have, uh, and do you want to talk about those forces that, do you have any idea who or what they come from? Well, I think in this nation, there's always been an underground group who were dissatisfied with their lot in life. And they use various forces like race, religion, color, uh, politics as an excuse to do some of the things that they did. And when you stop and think that law enforcement was very much aware of the fact that there were certain underground forces loose in this nation regarding a man's right to liberty and pursuit of happiness. And how could they set that up that they were completely unaware that there were forces that were intent upon destroying this nation as it was then. Uh, for example, if you allow a certain group to possess weapons and to abuse and misuse other citizens and uh, you pass it off as well, things are going to get better, and that's the cop's job, and so long as it's not me or my kind, I'm not too concerned. Well, that's, as the philosopher said back then, that's when you set in place forces that are determined to destroy this nation as we know it. So it's the everyday, quote-unquote, man and woman uh, who has a huge responsibility to make certain that they uh, see any sort of injustice as against other folks as something that they need to be concerned about. Absolutely, because it's their turn in the barrel next time. Now, if you say, let's just take the 30s. The 30s, without the Democrats and Social Security, as we know it, and that's 50, 60 years ago, look what the fact that Social Security was enacted. And that came through whom? The Democratic Party. Yes, it did. Now, all of the benefits that have helped John Q's citizen have basically come through the Democrats. Now, you say to yourself, well then, how is it that the last 20 odd years, uh, the word Democrat has meant something other than being helpful, right, philosophical, all of, the, all of the positives. Moral values. That's right, absolutely. But the moral values are being used against absolutely. Democrats. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And why is it we don't seem to understand that? Why is it that they don't say on TV when they're debating, name me one social program that came through for the benefit of American citizens through the opposite party, through the Republican Party. Just name me one. And what I'm saying to you now is what I've said it openly at meetings. If the Democrats are so bad, then how is it all these generations of individuals have been able to live a good life based upon the social reforms that they've set in place? Name me one social reform to benefit the American citizen that the Republican Party ever came down with. So, Just name me one. It, does that go back to the, the, the notion that uh, what's happening, given that Republicans are in charge, yes. perhaps is we don't really care about our fellow citizen as much as we can. If you're doing all right. That's right. And if you don't agree with some very personal issues that we call moral values. Yes. You're, gonna, you're going to then exclude or disassociate yourself with those folks. They're not your problem. Their That's problems right. have nothing to do with you, and uh, they don't live like you, so. Plus the fact that 
the laws as we read and as we interpret them today, you can cause a problem possibly if your views are widespread about the fact that there is a certain dominant party or theme for the party. And all of those who run against that theme or philosophy run into problems. They looked at as obstructionists, unpatriotic. Absolutely. All of the buzzwords yeah. to make you unpopular. And why do we fall for it? Why does the John Q. Citizen, as you put it, fall for that? Because it's not me. To thine own self be true. If I'm doing well, that I don't want to be black or Catholic or this or that. I just want to get along so I can make money and live a good life and take care of my kids. The only time that I become upset is when someone, not like me necessarily, creates a problem that I perceive, why don't you just go along? Well, it's better here than someplace else and so forth. All of the buzzwords to justify not doing the right thing for the right thing, for the right thing itself. For, just for the moral, ethical. That's right. Not just for the, not for the self, selfish. Well, uh, it's self-gratification. Here we are. I can do anything so long as I'm not what? Black, Hispanic, poor, uh, uh, union. All of these things are a detriment to my living well in this nation. At once upon a time, the last, back in the 20s and 30s, before the uh, NRA and the CCs and all of these benefits to help John Q. Sibsery came through one party. It wasn't the Democrats that said, uh, we'll set aside certain portions of our wealth as trusts. That happened back in the 20s, and they weren't Democrats. And now you come all the way up to today and the things that the Democrats have aided and abetted and put into place to benefit all of the citizenry now have become the selective viewpoint of those who have money, who have power, so forth and so on, and they take that very same thing and work it against you and set you one against the other. And who can afford to go against the grain? Uh, not all whites were against blacks, not all blacks were against whites and whatever, but what they do is they separate us sect by sect, group by group, while they play games with our heads. And then we can look at the bigger issues That's right. regarding the power That's exactly right. structure and... That's uh, there. What's it? Absolute power dest the destructs. Absolutely. Machiavelli, yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. yes. Now, I want to ask you, um, why should we really care about our fellow citizenry? I mean, why, maybe we've evolved to a point where, hey, listen, everything is available for you to make a success for yourself if you want to. And if you don't, then there's just, you know, you're not working hard enough. So I have no time because things are moving. I got to get mine, you know, uh, and, and you should be able to get yours. Just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Why isn't that in our right attitude? Well, you see, that's not in our Bible. That's not what God told us, and I'm a Presbyterian, and I go to church not too often, so I, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm a, uh, uh, I'm a, a Christer or, you know, I'm bringing in religion. All I'm saying is that the golden rule applies to us all, and if, in fact, all of the laws that we have to protect the rights of American citizens encompass us all, not a certain select few, and the philosophy that states that I can take all things from the system, and at the same time, those things that are against the system, that I feel are against the system, then I want to deprive you of them because I have the money or the power. Now, they're saying now about Social Security. <laughs> well, I've drawn Social Security, and I've been drawing it for quite a while. But just imagine if back in the 30s, there was no such thing as Social Security. I remember when they used to come and bring miners' bodies on the porch 
My my grandfather and, and, was and that's right was killed in the mines and that's basically what happened right. to my, my grandmother. Sure. And she couldn't even speak English. That's right. Here you go. And look yeah. at John L. Lewis. Look what he did. Right. Look at the look at the Ruther brothers there in in, in Detroit. Uh, you have to fill fill us in. The Ruther brothers, John L. Lewis. We well, have five minutes, so and I have four more questions for you. So can you give us a brief history <laughs> of uh, the, the Ruther brothers and the Ruther Lewis? brothers organized unions in the auto plants in Detroit, Michigan. Okay. Uh, John L. Lewis started to socially and uh, uh, job-wise help the miners. Uh, eight hours for eight, eight hours pay, I believe it was, and, and uh, put in place safeguards to help the miners from getting an eye blown out and so forth. Well, maybe, maybe Mr. Mitchell, it, we are a, a species <laughs> that needs major trouble in our face before we react in, in, in this sort of manner where we organize and start. Absolutely, but it has to affect us en masse because right, right. If, it's, if it's, and that's what they play. They play group against group. It's just like Mein Kampf. And he did that to a master. And we, we've incorporated some of the Mein Kampf motivations. And, and it's true, it's true the powers today, that be. It? That's right. Uh, first of all, Fascinating insight that you have, and I, and I, I want to go on further. This always happens. We just start get, getting a, a nice <laughs> yeah. momentum, and they tell me it's five minutes. We're taking over the station. Sean, <laughs> lock it down. <laughs> uh, all right, we, we, have, um, we have a couple more questions, really, sure. really uh, important questions. I want you to tell me, and brief answers, because I want to get okay. all these in, if you can. Mm -hmm. How do you define the concept we call community? Group integrity. Group integrity. Mm -hmm. Expound on that, group integrity. Well, we believe in a certain truth that all men are created equal. And then you expand on that from that point on. Does that include women? It includes everyone. Okay. That's mankind, period. Okay. Expand on that. So I have the basic premise that we're all created equal. That's community. That's right. And, and we should do those things the good for the whole, not for a select group or a certain uh, philosophy, but all of us are complete in this picture that we should all have an equal spot at the table. Excuse me. <coughs> Some of the things that happen, though, from my own experience, and maybe we're just two cynical guys sitting at the table, but I don't think so. Um, as time goes on, people get tired mm -hmm. of fighting. Yes, they do. They, and they, they, maybe you will get enticed by a decent paying job where the, yes. they have to give up their principles. Yes. And they are able, they have to rationalize it. Yes, they do. Be, so they, they, they lose that fire. That well, vision. it becomes the lesser of two evils. Right, right. Because right, this, this is unattainable. That's but right. But the life I'm living now is too hard. How do you give get up? That? Right. Okay. So how do you get past that? Well, you have to find others with the same type of philosophy that you have, the dignity of mankind, which encompasses men and women, mother and father, sister, child, irregardless to race, creed, or color. And that encompasses the entire world. And what it is, if it's good for my neighbor, then by extension, it's good for me also. Okay. <coughs> Excellent. Another question. How do you define the term family? We are all family. Uh, all of us look alike to a degree. Uh, by philosophy, by belief, by tissue and bone, we are all family. The varying degrees of color or philosophies only magnify whom and what we are. And it's the duty of the whole, the survival of the fittest, is all of us together. The survival of the fittest is all of us together. Whoa, well, I like that. Huh. All right, I have another one for you. Sean, are we in lockdown mode? We are locked down there. <laughs> that was awesome, all right. Yes. Okay. Um, some of the individuals you most respect. Well... It would have to be Gandhi, 
would have to be Dr. King, Roosevelt, um, that surgeon, that black surgeon who took uh, a bullet from a man way back when, when you break 39, you, you don't always remember the time and place or the name, but uh, anyone who has done something to benefit mankind, that's irrespective of race, creed, or color. So long as you help John Q. Citizen in whatever fashion you choose to do so, then you're a benefit. And by extension, we should all go towards you rather than against you. Well put. Last question, I promise. Hey, Dr. Stavala's in the, uh, in the studio. All right, Doc. Getting my heart checked right after this. Uh, chain smoker. Um, what at present, Mr. Mitchell, concerns you the most in life? And what at present inspires you the most in life? Well, I raised uh, seven children, four girls, three boys. And I have seven granddaughters, five grandsons, three great-grandsons, and one great-granddaughter. And all of them are doing well with the exception of one boy who has MS. But as my daughter, the one who lives in California, said uh, when she entered this contest and the first prize was $25,000, she said, don't worry, Grandpa, I'm a Mitchell. I'm going to win it. And so she did, you know. And uh, I have three granddaughters who are executive assistants to major presidents of major corporations. For example, the one who, had, uh, who built the, uh, the uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, USS Ronald Reagan. And he said, to her, she just told me this about a week, a couple weeks ago. She said, Dad, I asked him for more money. And uh, he said, well, Donna, or rather Margie, I was planning to give you X amount of thousand. She said, I know, but I want a little bit more. And he said to her, and this is what she said, well, you run this whole plant. Okay, no deal. Uh, and that's what, that's what you'll get. And she said, how about that, Dad? Ain't these Mitchell something? I say, you got it, honey. And that's where my family is. They've that's your inspiration. Been. Yes. That's your inspiration, your family. Yeah, yeah. We can do anything. And that's a great message and attitude to have. To, yeah. to, to, and uh, so they have. You know, they're, they're all doing well. They get one millionaire, and the rest of them are doing very well. Well, what concerns you? Your family inspires you, and I can, that's an excellent thing. What concerns you? What concerns me is the fact that if a family can do it, we can all do it. And there should not be such a thing as poverty or uh, hatred and so forth and so on, because it's a lot, waste of time. We've only got a certain number of years, months, and days here. And you have to do the very best that you can for yourself and, by extension, your neighbor. All right. Mr. Mitchell, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Oh, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you so much. Yeah. First time this has ever happened. Uh, Mr. Bob Mitchell here in Stories, Wisdom, and Recipes. My name is Lawrence Pugliese, and until next time, have a nice uh, Lenten period, have a nice V-Day, and have a nice Valentine's Day. We'll see you in about two weeks. And remember, watch the ice. Yes. <laughs> Once again, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Boris Garcia's family reunion.